I'm on work release, <laughs> as many of you, I'm sure, are. Uh, but from solitary confinement, this is the studio. Um, in July, three afternoons in a row, the hottest afternoons of July, I found myself um, standing in the sewage treatment facility at Hanover, New Hampshire, and wondering what had happened. Um, I was sketching clarifiers and aeration tanks in my sketchbook and taking in that rich... <laughs> and um, I thought I would just tell you why I was there. I'm supposed to be working on a project about invention, about... And, and it, it began sort of as how one invention leads to another and, and so on. And, and we had this title, there were a couple of us who began this thing th two or three years ago. And, um, I came up with this title, I said, Look, how about something like, That Changes Everything? And everybody said, that's great, that's great, that's great. So, and I went back to my studio and I realized I hadn't a clue what that meant. Nor would I know how you change everything or how any invention changed everything. So I said, I need more information. Um, so I asked the researcher to give me more information, to give me some timelines, basically, of major categories of information from food, clothing, and shelter, and communication, and transportation, and so on and so forth. And I'd start to build these visual timelines, um, sometimes se separating one strand and following it, and, you know, all the way uh, through this thing, showing sort of comparative what was going on on one strand while something else was happening on another strand. Not that at the time those individuals would, would ever have known necessarily, although there, was a, there has been a fair amount of communication. So I began then to sort of separate, separate some of these items and, and focus on them a little bit more. And here, you know, this, the whole idea of telling time and using uh, sundials is, is great until night. Um, um, and having a, uh, you know, a water clock is terrific, and unless you're in Northern Europe and it's winter and time literally freezes. So uh, you start to um, think about, okay, what can we come up with? And you look back at books, often Islamic books, um, that contain information about time-telling machines, Chinese information that came through uh, Islamic literature and so on. And you start getting your local blacksmith to, bring, to build some of these uh, incredible uh, machines and you begin to be able to sort of tell time. And then you introduce springs, and you introduce, if you're Huygens, the pendulum, and you start to improve these, these bits of technology. Um, one of the reasons why people in one area would know what was going on in another area is because of um, the increased availability of books, thanks to Gutenberg. And, and movable type, although he didn't invent it, he simply adopted it at a smart time. And in a smart culture where you only have 26 letters, basically, as opposed to 7,000, which makes it a little hard to find the, you know, does anybody know where the one about the moon over the duck is? Um, so anyway, it's easier for us, and we can crank out this literature and gradually spread knowledge. Um, and I, I, can, I can never resist doing a little... Uh, how it works kind of thing and the printing press and so on. But the more important image here is the one on the right that sort of sets up these icons of communication um, sort of at the edges of, of the known world and sending this stuff off into the lesser known. But I didn't know what I was doing with this book about invention. Let's not lose sight of that. So I thought, let me just back up here and, and look at technology and sort of evolution of technology and we'll start with a river and I'll have lightning hit something, we'll have fire and then we'll talk about how to make your own fire when you want it, not when it suits uh, the, the, the gods, and um, sort of gradually then using fire to create building materials and, and um, to separate iron from ore, and uh, then you need bellows and you need pieces of equipment and so on, and then this thing began to get more complicated, and I start looking at the time thing here, and um, you know, we got a, a musket being um, developed around the same time as Harvey is uh, understanding how the pulse moves, you know, represents the movement of blood, thanks to the heart, through the body. Uh, the arm holding a tankard of beer, which has been made using coke as opposed to coal, because it tastes a lot better if you don't let the, coke, the coal fumes um, get near your cooked hops. Um, problem um, that came up fairly early on was the um, need to get at coal and iron in deeper and deeper mine shafts, and that was always a situation that, you know, reminded people of water tables. So we need to come up with ways of removing water from these mines to get at the materials. This 
allows me to sort of go back to Galileo, who was obviously not always loved in his own land, and, um, but he had these terrific ideas, and he you know, had questions about things like um, why you can only lift water a certain level in a tube and so on. And um, Torricelli picks that up and comes up with this idea that basically is a, a, you know, a barometer, understands this notion of the vacuum, and um, is smart enough to have uh, Pascal in France get his brother-in-law to drag a barometer up this mountain somewhere in the middle of France, and they keep sort of taking readings at different altitudes to prove, even in France, um, there's this thing called atmospheric pressure, and it changes depending on how high up you are. So, um, von Garrick is this other character around the same time who's, you know, a military guy and a politician and an experimenter and a little bit of a crazy, he would have done t terrific and, and done really well in Providence. Um, <laughs> So, he, so anyway, what he's done is he wants to create a vacuum, his own vacuum, where he, and, and have it where he needs it, when he needs it. So he invents this pump, and he's got this glass orb with a little nozzle on it, and he sticks it in the pump, and he starts cranking away, and he walks around with this vacuum in a glass ball. And he takes it over to this uh, cylinder that he's built with a piston in it, and you can see how the, um, the top of the piston is fastened with a rope over a pulley to a bunch of gentlemen. And um, when he puts the glass orb into a socket on the side of the cylinder and releases the, um, uh, you know, opens it, the uh, air is sucked immediately out of the cylinder, the piston drops because it's pushed down by the atmospheric pressure, and the gentlemen all stumble forward. Um, Huygens does the same thing. Um, he has a slightly different uh, approach, a big cylinder, and uh, he decides to light some gunpowder in it, and that will blow the air out through these leather uh, valves on either side, and that will give some young boys, he couldn't afford gentlemen, he got some young boys and attached them to a rope, and they got lifted up in the air, and it's probably a thrill. But it's not the kind of system you could keep using over and over again because you have to get in there, clean out the stuff, and put in new gunpowder and so on. Um, uh, so we, 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 it's not really working that well, but Savory comes up with this idea. Remember, the water in the well is what we're trying, I mean, in the mine is what we're trying to eliminate. And um, he starts to construct this system out of hammered metal and so on and so forth. Um, it, it doesn't really work that well. Uh, Huygens and Papin... Uh, uh, have worked on it. Uh, Papin ends up building a, a bone digester to uh, digester to sort of reduce bones to get the uh, the good stuff out, so that poor people have something to spread on their bed. The bread. Newcomen comes up with an actual working steam engine, um, which becomes very successful. It's uh, it's not perfect, but it's better than anything they had, and they can actually drain the mines. But other people see these this steam engine, um, and they see this part of it, the relationship between the boiler and the furnace, and the piston, and um, they stick it on wheels. Uh, Cugnot in France sticks it on a tricycle, which is not a great idea, but he's got the military behind him at least for a little while, so he can take this thing further than it probably should have ever gone. But it is a wonderful contraption. And you can, one of the great things about it, one of the things I love about it is that you look at it carefully and you can still see it explain itself to you. Um, Trevithick, on the other hand, is building something a little more practical, a stationary steam engine, high-pressure steam engine, so it can be smaller, and by using the, uh, the heat from the furnace, which is fed through the boiler, and then finally out through the smokestack, he's able to bo boil water, create steam more, more efficiently, and um, to turn a wheel, which will drive a belt shaft or gears or whatever it is, um, and or you put it on wheels and um, build tracks for it so it doesn't destroy your road. If you're a Fitch in 1790 in the US, you can put it in the middle of a boat. Now, Fitch had a limited problem. Um, it was, he designed a limited problem for himself. He decided that, OK, I want us to have a boat that goes across the river. We're going to use a steam engine in the middle, so he makes his version of the Newcomen engine. But he still likes the idea of paddles. Um, so he doesn't think bigger than just changing the, the, the you know, the prime mover. Um, and it's this, you know, Rube Goldberg contraption. It must have been hysterical to watch, although people probably were quite impressed, as I would have been then, too. Um, we take that same technology, we magnify it, um, and we stick it on a boat, and we're trans traveling back and forth across the Atlantic under um, steam power. But we're not taking the masts off the ship just yet. It's still kind of new. Um, and we don't want to take too many chances. Once you're out there, you're really out there. At least we could drop the sails if it, if it really fails. Um, I took all these sketches at some point. I had a wall built in the studio across, dividing it in half. And um, I put them all up because my publisher was coming to see me, and he wanted to know why we didn't have any books done yet. And, um, and how, what, you know, so I had to make it look like we had this thing. And um, out of the conversation um, came this idea that I proposed to them, and, and we finally had to do it, of creating readers for six and seven-year-olds, nonfiction readers, to get kids, probably mostly boys, interested in um, reading by 
sucking them into this, this, this you know, how it works kind of information. And this is the jet. And there's Da Vinci um, uh, perfecting his, uh, his little helicopter thing. I think if anybody deserves to sit on the plane with the screaming kids, it's Da Vinci. I hold him personally responsible. Um, and then so through this, you know, you have 75 words of spread. That's all you've got. And there are some text blocks missing here from these. But you get the idea. I mean, try to explain, the, you know, the sort of... Uh, uh, jet engine in 75 words on a single spread, or even lift and all that sort of stuff. But the, the idea was to make a series of drawings that would recognize in the reader, in the young reader, that the curiosity is there, the imagination may very well be there, even if the desire to read words isn't yet there. So my hope is to create these sort of visual entrees um, into the world of, of reading by getting a kid to ask questions from the pictures, to be stimulated enough by these pictures to ask questions that will actually force them to, to read the words or to have somebody help them read the words. It may work. It's, um, we'll see what happens. Readers aren't new things, but I'm trying to make them at a certain level so that the kid really feels this is, you know, this is a respectable book to carry around. Um, so I got that finished, and this guy, John Shore, one of my favorite discoveries, he invented the tuning fork. Who invents the tuning fork? Come on. <laughs> Um, but he, my guess is he dropped a fork and, and um, it made a sound and he thought, well, that's like a C sharp. The interesting thing about John Shore is he was the trumpeter and um, he played really, really well and Handel wrote some of his, own, his passages for John Shore to play. Who knew this? Um, but John Shore splits his lip. Fortunately, he's also a lutenist, but he hates tuning the damn thing, except he's now got this tuning fork. So there you go. Um, you notice that there's a Watt engine. This is the improvement on Newcomen. I'm just, I'm, I'm gathering information here and trying to build this thing. Um, that flyball governor, that little um, red thing in the middle there that, can, that actually controls the speed at which this thing turns so it doesn't just fall apart if it gets really gusty, um, was originally in windmills in front of which you can see a reaper, which you know, sort of takes us to the sort of Midwest and the McCormick Reaper, which will arrive in all these parts in a box probably a crate, and you've got to put it together with or without the instructions. There's no website. I have this record player in my studio that I um, never realized used a fly ball governor. Um, good old-fashioned spinning, you know, the balls move out and so on and so forth to control uh, the speed. Okay, so I'm taking now all that crap off the wall that served the purpose of making the publisher feel like we were actually making some progress and um, reducing this book. They want a big book. They, they want the, you know, the readers are fine and it makes them have something, you know, gives them something to sell. But they want this big book. So I'm thinking, okay, I can do a 32-page book, but um, maybe I just need to do 10 of them. And so that's the sort of structure of the book. And that sort of guided me that I needed more stories. And those stories led me through um, information about people who played with static electricity, um, people who uh, created telegraph systems that sort of bound France together with these stone towers. Um, but again, once it's night, it's a little hard to see what the signals are saying. So it doesn't really work. You've got electricity, though, um, just coming into its own and the idea of sending messages from one place to another very, very quickly, which will lead you to the telegraph machine, which uses as a control mechanism to keep the paper moving at the right flow, the same clockwork idea that we saw at the very beginning when we had to replace um, water clocks. Or you can use a part of your piano and stick it into this telegraph, a Hughes telegraph, which was very popular. Um, here's Leon Scott, and he is um, trying to sort of record water, uh, not water, but a sound. Um, and he, he's studying ears and ear bones, and he comes up with the system, and I could explain it more, but I won't. But um, d uh, Edison is doing the same thing at the same time, using a cylinder also, but with um, foil around it. And, um, he comes up with this terrific contraption, which he puts on the steamboat, um, uh, similar to this one, and sends across to England um, for a concert at this building. And uh, there is the setup there, you know, the, so the total, talk about the DJ sort of backwards. Batteries under the table to keep this thing running. They record this amazing concert of 4,000 people singing Handel, which takes us back to John Shore. Meanwhile, the devices that were invented by Paxton for building this thing, and you notice there's nothing on the cards yet. So I'm getting a little nervous about that. So I get more information. When I'm lost, I just get more information. And now we start talking about carbon rods and how, you know, you keep them either close together or far apart to get the right length for a spark to fly, which creates light. But then in your own light switch where that thing will happen, you want to make sure it happens really quickly so there is no spark because you don't want light inside your light switch. Um, so uh, that's how that works. And then Edison um, 
comes up with this bulb, and we're, so I'm just, as I'm lost, I'm just getting more and more information, thinking, well, this is Waller, he comes up with this heart, um, you know, measuring device, uh, which runs on a little toy train, clockwork, and, and here we have filaments that, they knew that the metal filament would probably be better than paper or carbonized anything bamboo, but um, they hadn't really figured out how to spiral it yet so you could squeeze this really long thing to get enough resistance to create the light. And um, the cards still have nothing on them. And um, so I actually went to uh, the second of the readers, um, and I'll sort of stop here, um, which is toilet. And um, the whole idea was to sort of take you through the digestive system to the toilet. <laughs> Um, to the, you know, six, six to seven year olds, um, to how it actually works, and to help you through it, there's a perplexed pooch who's lost his dog biscuit. And um, some people have septic tanks, and you learn how bacteria works for you in your backyard. Um, many people do not have room for septic tanks, so you have to have a larger system, which is why I was at the Hanover Sewage Treatment Plant on the hottest days in July this past summer. Thank you very much.